the session is on the fight to end gun violence and how they are influencing policy change and inspiring the next generation. You can share your thoughts and ideas on the session using the hashtags, hashtag WEF20 or hashtag Open Forum. We're thrilled to be here in the auditorium of the Swiss Alpine High School here in Davos. There is, of course, an overall focus on youth at this year's Open Forum, with 10 teenage change makers attending the annual meeting 2020, including, of course, Naomi Wadler, our wonderful guest today. Now, I know, Naomi, that you were here earlier. You took part in the Power of Youth session at the Open Forum. And now, more than ever, we're seeing that the power of youth have in addressing many of the world's current challenges. So we are so delighted to be here and to meet, see so many young people in our audience and I'm sure online as well. Now, I'd just like to give you a brief introduction to our very special guest. As I said, Naomi, who's an activist, she's just 13 years old, and she started when she led a student walk out at her elementary school in Virginia when she was 11 to mark the one-month anniversary of the school shooting at Marjorie Stoneman High School in Parkland, Florida. Her walkout was 18 minutes long, 17 minutes for each student and teacher who lost their lives, and another minute for Cortland Arrington, a black student who was murdered shortly after the Parkland shooting in her Alabama high school. Naomi's mission is to empower African-American and black girls, and she hopes more people will join her effort to remember Cortland and the many victims that have been lost to gun violence. Will I Am is founder and chief executive officer of I Am Plus and a cultural leader. He's also, as we know, a musical genius. And in my humble opinion... <laughs> I don't like that word, that genius is... I like music. <laughs> Well, I've known you many years, and to me, he's a Renaissance man. He's a creative innovator, future, futurist entertainer, and World Economic Forum Crystal Award winner in 2018 for his philanthropy as an advocate for STEAM education. His I Am Angel Foundation delivers STEAM programs and support for at-risk youth. He's co-executive producer on Parkland Rising, a documentary film about the students and families that survived the mass shooting at the school and their journey as advocates for US gun safety reform. So please, once again, welcome our special guests. Now, just before we start the discussion, I'd like to give you a context of why we are here this evening, and we would like to show a trailer for the Parkland Rising documentary. As I mentioned, Will I Am is a co-producer of the documentary about the aftermath of the February 14th, 2018 school shooting at the school in Parkland, Florida. The shooting claimed the lives of 17 people and ignited a movement against gun violence. The slogan for the documentary reads, the young people will win as a reminder of all the young activists who are fighting for change in American policy in order to ensure a safer future for generations to come. So please, let's see the trailer. Stoneman Douglas High School. Please What's going on? Who? We'll be shooting at a place. I'm getting a school shooting at Stoneman Douglas High School in Harpen. Okay. Let's go, 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 let's go,
one main thing is to keep away from hate, hating anybody. It's very easy to fall into that. If we don't take action now, these things are going to continue. We call BS. People tell me things like they want to kill my son. It's really hard to take as a parent because we're targets. I love your group. You look very powerful, all of you together. Here they come. All eyes were on us. People were like, this isn't going to work, this isn't going to work. And I was like, oh, yeah, it is. We want change. We want change. We want change. We're here to get shit done. If you listen real close, you can hear the people in power shaking. shaking. We've lost our friends. What else do we have to lose? Every day we wake up, we pray, and then we start our battle every single day. This is the image we weren't able to see that day on graduation. Jesus Christ. Is there another school shooting today? No, 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 no. It's all that we are. this year. And if every single one of those people votes, we can make real change in this country. This is what democracy looks like. The young people will win. The young people will always win. Look, I'm sure all of us have had a very emotional reaction to that trailer. Naomi and Will, I want to know how you feel when, when you see that. I feel empowered. Um, a lot of the kids um, from Parkland I'm very close to, Emma, David, Jackie, Lauren, um, they're some of my best friends. And so it's, it's hard watching them go through all that pain, but I feel very liberated being able to help them and being able to communicate with them and be an ally. Because even though I'm not fully able to comprehend what it's like, I think the collaboration of people, um, even if you don't know what an experience is like, being able to try your best to understand and to support them through their journey. You were only 11 years old, though, Naomi, when it was happening, and you spent time with them, as you said. How did that affect you at such a young age? Um, I was used to it. I mean, living in the U.S., when I remember being in my mom's office, it was Valentine's Day, I was opening up the gifts that I got from my classmates, and I saw it on the TV. And of course, I was horrified, but it's something that had happened so many times before in the country. And so the scary part was that I was numb to it. And it was, it was almost mundane. And I, I had seen it before. I was, in, I was five years old when um, the shooting at Sandy Hook took place. And I remember a bunch of parents coming to pick their kids up early. Um, at my elementary school, when I was in second grade, a man two blocks away from the school shot two women and was running around in the neighborhood, and so we were on lockdown, and there were a lot of, um, there was a SWAT team who came into the school, and so I, I mean, it's horrifying, like I said, because I, I was used to it, and it didn't really affect me, and I, I, I was used to seeing it. So being with the kids and being able to talk to them and share their pain and really be able to motivate ourselves and realize that we deserve better than this was a really great experience. Well, it's interesting how Naomi is saying that she almost became desensitized to this. How important is it for you to produce a film like this? Well, seeing, if, seeing you know, People cry out and no response. It just breaks my heart. Um, 
it makes me feel like I want to do more, but confused on where to do more, but you still do all that you can because it, it really, it, it, it messes with your mind because it doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. So many kids have lost their lives just for going to school. Um, and we know how we quickly changed, you know, the way we travel because of 9-11, right? We can't even go on airplanes with lotion because safety, and that's good. That's to get from one place to another. But for a kid in America to get from one place to another and get equipped with the skill sets, they're left in harm's way, that confuses me. I don't get it. And so I'm going to continue to do all that I can, whether it's make documentaries, songs, like Big Love. I made a song with a, an amazing young girl. Her name is Baby Kaylee. She was six years old at the time about Sandy Hook. And nothing happened. So it, 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 it makes me feel like, <clears throat> can we not? move the needle? Can we not move this obstacle? But I'm not going to give up, you know, so, and, and the kids from Parkland really inspired me because after Sandy Hook, I didn't, I lost hope. Yeah. But they, 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 they put energy in me to, to, um, to support their cause and remember what it was probably like for me when I went to school. I, I was, um, there was a school shooting at summer school. I went to Fairfax, it was 1992. And a kid lost his life at school. It happened so much in America. And we are desensitized. Yeah. Naomi, you did the walkout for 17 minutes, but you did that extra minute for Cortland. What did that mean to you? So growing up, um, I've seen so many black girls, or rather the point is I haven't seen so many black girls' um, stories. I haven't seen them grow. I haven't, I, I didn't know their names. And so when I heard, learned that Cortland passed, um, she maybe had this tiny section at the bottom of a newspaper um, describing her name, what happened, and that was about it. And that's, that's what I usually see. I usually see African American girls not getting any attention. I usually see them, um, experienced so much violence and it not being um, paid attention to. And so John Benet Ramsey, what happened to her was a tragedy, but we're still hearing about it almost 30 years afterwards because she was a little white girl that passed away and her life matters so much more than any other black girl who dies in the inner city, than any other black girl who dies on the way to school. We don't hear about them, their statistics, their numbers. And so I really wanted to bring light to Cortland's story and make sure that she wasn't forgotten like millions of other girls. Do you really believe that, that there is that opinion out there that it, a white life matters more? That's the whole, um, so when Black Lives Matter first came um, to the center of the activist world, there was a counter movement, All Lives Matter, which just showed how threatened people were that we were speaking on behalf of people of color. It showed that they, they didn't want to be seen as the bad guys. I mean, people often get really uncomfortable having race conversations because they feel like, we're accusing them. Yeah. Like we're saying, you are racist. Your ancestors were racist. You are the bad guy. When in actuality, we're not saying that. But that's the common belief. So where should the conversation go then, if that's the feeling? Where do you think it could move forward? Will, what do you think? Invest in inner cities. Um, it all, just follow the dollar. So if you go to Palisades in Brentwood, where I was lucky to go to school, you know, a kid gets eight to $10,000 a year for their education. Um, but in the ghettos, where there's black and brown, if you go to school in your neighborhood that you're born and raised, it's five to $6,000 for your education. And those kids are in harm's way. Um, there's more homicides in inner cities when you, if you follow the investment um, and those kids that lose their lives, 
you don't really hear anything about. Yeah. A lot of my friends that I grew up with that were brown and black friends, they lost their lives. They didn't talk about it on the news. So that is true. Um, and those kids that have a five to $6,000 per year education, they're subject to juvenile hall because they're in harm's way um, and only have you know, a, a life of crime to make money. Um, and then there's a jail cell that's privatized, yeah. waiting for them on the other end too, which is really inhumane mm. that <clears throat> you know, we're not going to invest in you but then you're going to help us make money in this privatized prison. That is, that's just, that doesn't sound like America, but that is America. What you're describing is the school to prison pipeline. So if you go to school in America, maybe in um, a less fortunate neighborhood, and you have to use clear backpacks because they want to see what you're using. You get stopped at, if you're a girl for wearing a skirt that's too short or you can't graduate, like I heard, because you have dreads. You're treated like you're a criminal. You're criminalized, even if you're innocent. And so then when you grow up, you've been treated your entire life you are, like you are this dangerous person. And so then you grow to become that. Yeah. Because if you're told that mm. you're you really are. smart, you're probably going to yeah. believe that you're really smart. And so if you're told your entire life that you can only be this one thing and that you can only amount to this certain thing. Why would you do something that's else? That's what you'll, yeah. you're going to do and that's what um, gets young African American girls yeah, um, but that's and not, men into so prison. I, I grew up in the projects and I was told that you know, I was going to amount to nothing. Um, I didn't believe that shit. Mm. Yeah. You know, because yeah. my mom really my mom reinforced a different belief in myself. Yeah. But a lot of kids don't have that support yeah. at home life. So I was, I was lucky to have, you know, an awesome mom. I still have an awesome mom um, and attend an awesome school. But for all those kids that you know, he's talking about, it shouldn't be that way. Mm. It shouldn't be that way in America. I, I, you know, yeah. I, don't, I don't understand if, if this was some other country that didn't market itself as the freest country in the world. Yeah, I get it, but this is, it's a, America. Well, how do you think that you came out of it? I mean, I know that your mother was a huge influence. I've even traveled with you to where you grew up. What was it, do you think, that made you different and want to take a different path? Do you put it down to your mother? Um, encouragement, um, love, um, Encouragement goes a long way. When you tell a kid where they're awesome, it could be any part. It may seem insignificant on the grand scheme of things, but you tell a kid they're awesome and believe it when you tell them. And, and have them showcase their awesomeness. That goes millions and millions of miles. Yeah. And, um, and, but if you're always pointing at a kid's you know, woes and their problems and you make them feel like they're never going to amount to anything and the only folks that are there for them are the gang that make them feel a part of something, then you, that, that's the outcome you have. Naomi, where do you think that your passion came from to make this difference, to use your platform to change so I was lucky enough to grow up in a household where my mom and my dad always had these conversations with me. I know a lot of kids are pretty sheltered and they're not really aware of what's going on with politics or um, really anything outside of their own neighborhood, outside of their own bubble. And so in my household, the news is always on. And I remember after the Charlottesville riot in Virginia, my parents, um, we were all crying and we were all talking. And I mean, it was that confusion and that anger, but I was able to channel it into something more and I was able to talk about it. I think that, like we said, conversations regarding race yeah. aren't really um, had, especially if you don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, growing up as a black person in America, there's no other choice but to confront it. Yeah. But if you're growing up in a white family and you're very privileged, you don't have to worry about any of that. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't have the, you don't have to, you just don't. You're very privileged, you don't have to worry. But not all white people, though. I know a lot of poor white folks in oh, America yeah. mm. that they don't have. We have to be really sensitive by saying if you're white, then you're right. There's a lot of folks in America that are struggling that are white, too. Mm. 
and we need a we need just a couple struggling people or struggling people, whether you're black, white, or brown. Yeah. Um, but to, to being black in America is you have this added pressure mm-hmm. of weaponized everything. Mm-hmm. You know, they weaponize everything against us. The police is weaponized against us in our in our neighborhoods. That's the only. That's the biggest differentiation between poor blacks and poor whites. Mm-hmm is that the police are weaponized against us in our own communities and the folks that are policing in our communities do not come from our communities and understand the conditions of our communities and our communities are a police state. Exactly. It's like a war zone. Well, what do you think when you hear Naomi, uh, 13 years old, the power of youth, what do you think that they can achieve? So you know like when they teach history and they teach about all the folks that fought for equal rights. When you, when you learn about history, those people you look at as adults, they weren't really adults. They were the youth. And so when I hear people like Naomi and Greta, I'm like, yeah, here comes the new squad. <laughs> the, new, the new squad for this new era that we're in. I'm like, dang, if I had a kid, I wanted to be just like her. You, like, are awesome. Thank you so much. Really. What has inspired you the most, Will, from what you've seen with Naomi and her fellow young activists, do you think, so far? How fearless she is. Mm. And her fearlessness connected to how much she loves. Because there could be a lot of anger connected to fearlessness. Yeah. And she would be a different Naomi. She, there's so much love there of the things she's fighting for, and she's fearless in who she has to fight to bring resolution, and that is what I what I see in this girl. And Naomi, of course, you have your peers who are also trying to do what you're doing and to get these communities to actually not be affected and to have schools like we're sitting in today, tonight become safe places. What sort of action do you feel that you can do? Um, I feel like we can educate our youth a lot better. I think that a lot of what we're learning in school is math equations and the required history and who invented the light bulb, stuff like that. But we're not delving deeper into um, social justice movements from the past. We learned that Dr. King gave a speech, he had a dream, and then he was shot. We don't really know anything more. We don't talk about him anymore. And after like second, third, fourth grade, we don't talk about him again. And so I think that if we can do immerse, really immerse ourselves in the world of activism and in different perspectives, diverse perspectives. Because if we grow up and we're um, only teaching our kids about one thing and a certain kind of person and a certain kind of belief, they're not going to think that there's any other kind of way to live. And so if you only teach a child in school um, from the time they're in preschool to high school, Um, about the white scientists and about the white politicians, they're going to grow up and they're not going to respect the black or brown politicians because they were only taught this one way. So I think that the education system should, um, is pretty flawed and school's about passing, not learning at this point. So I think we should really um, immerse immerse ourselves in learning and the education that we can receive instead of just passing the math test. Do you have a role model, Naomi, that you look up to that you think actually, yes, they are trying to force change? Um, I really um, admire Jamila Jamil. Um, she is the most amazing woman. I did a digital show with Ellen DeGeneres, and she was one of the people that I interviewed, and she was honestly my favorite. Um, she's a wonderful advocate for self-love and body positivity, um, and she does it in such a peaceful manner, and being able to talk to her, and. Um, it was really one of the best conversations I've had in my life, and I really enjoyed that. Wow. And Will, you've talked about uh, where you grew up and the influence of your mother, and of course you've had huge global success in your career, and you're giving back through your foundation. Why was that so important for you? And tell everyone what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, when, you, when you come from the projects and you you've been mentored your whole life and encouraged 
to go down an entertainment path, I ran with that. Mm. And I promised my mom that I was going to buy her a house. And she said, don't make promises you can't keep. So imagine you're like 17 years old, and your mom is uh, 37. She's just 20 years older than you. That's young, by the way, a 37-year-old. And your kid is saying, I'm going to take care of you. Like How that breaks your heart and that how it fills your heart up. It's like a weird, if I had a 20-year-old at 40 and my kid told me, Daddy, I'm going to take care of you. And I'm struggling. I'm like, oh, oh I'm hurting. But you, you hate even having to say that because I can't take care of you the way I would like to. So she said, Willie, don't, take, keep, don't make promises you can't keep. I was like, no, Ma, you'll see them. You'll see. And so I bought my mom a house <laughs> shortly after that. Um, I was lucky to have a record deal at 17 years old. Um, when I came home with my check, she was like, where'd you get this check from? I didn't give you no permission to be getting no checks. <laughs> I was like, wow, it's my record deal. Um, and that was my fuel to take care of my mom and move her out of the projects. And it was the music that made me do that. And then by having um, success, and you, people want you to sell their products. And I love technology because I went to a science magnet school that we learned technology early on. I started realizing that the investment that companies are putting to make computers smarter outweigh the investment to make people smarter. And the folks that are going to get hit by that the hardest are kids in the inner cities. You think it's tough right now. Shit, 20 years from now, it's even crazier. You think we got racial issues now. Machinism is right around the corner. We're a machine who have more rights than people. That's something that we need to like wake up real fast. And so I go back to my neighborhood to teach our kids, you know, computer science, robotics. They need to know that I can make that. Because if they're not, if they're not given the skill sets to make what is going to be more intelligent than any of us in the building, then they're going to have this inferiority, inferiority pro, uh, um, complex. Anybody living and growing up in any you know, suburb, I mean, a ghetto, um, underdeveloped community, slum, you're going to see that intelligent machine, and you're going to be inferior. But if you have the perspective, I could make that, I know what it takes to make that machine, then you, you're, the, you're the king of that machine. It's man versus machine is, is this next leap that we're on. So, and who is making sure that we are upskilling um, our, our youth, especially kids in inner cities? You know, there's gonna be so many jobs rendered obsolete this decade. And who's gonna be hurt the most? I bet not the inner city because they have an opportunity to leapfrog. Because it's not like they're, they're the ones that um, are going to suffer from no jobs then. There's no jobs now. So they could leapfrog with these skill sets. And so that's the reason why I'm, 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 I went back to my neighborhood and other neighborhoods like mine to get the megaphone and say, this is the path. This way, guys. It's all about inspiring the youth will that feel that they don't have a future, isn't it? To break that pattern, as you were saying, Naomi, so they don't go into violence. But I just wanted to ask you, Naomi, because there's a very strong pushback by the gun lobby in the US to the student protests. How do you feel about the way that they treat you? Um, I think it's just arrogance and privilege. Um, I'm lucky enough not to have experienced a direct school shooting, but yet a 13-year-old is able to understand that it's wrong. Um, and so a lot of, I say, you can't educate ignorance. Um, it's just really not worth our time. And um, I was talking to somebody, and 
um, movements are really about mass mobilization, and so if we can get enough people in the streets um, and enough people um, ste stepping up, I still don't think that's enough. I think we need to get, if we have 100,000 people in the streets, that can be 100,000 18-year-olds who are registering to vote. And so we can elect those, we can get those people out of office and we can elect new people because mm -hmm. it's, it's not like we don't have a say in what's happening. I mean, that's what America is for the most part. Um, we're, we're able to choose who we want to be in charge. And so if everybody registers to vote and everybody um, is educated on what is going on, I mean, there's a question um, on whether or not we should lower the voting age to 16. Yes. Um, and mm. my answer to that is usually that would be great as long as we teach um, political science in schools so that it's not just a bunch of 16-year-olds who don't know what they're talking about and who are just voting because they can vote and voting because their parents do it, but a bunch of 16-year-olds who are educated and who know the policies they want to be put see put in place. Um, yeah. Have you thought about politics, Naomi? <laughs> um, for me? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> in the future, you speak so eloquently, and if you want to be in a position to change, then is that something that you might look towards to actually become a policy maker? I can only be pretty low on the political side of the spectrum because I was born in Ethiopia, and so I can't be president or vice president or secretary of state or high senator, really anything there, um, and you, so. You never know, it could change. It could change, but that was put in place like 200 years ago, yeah. and people have been trying to get it to change, I know. so. Well, like the right to bear arms, mm -hmm. and of course, this is the balance, and of course, that's ingrained in the American culture. Well, people don't want to lose their power. They don't want to lose their power, but it's that balance of power. What, before I open up to the audience for questions from them, what do you want to achieve from this documentary, Will? To inspire people to feel and have empathy for the kids that are, have gone through it. It's like this dark, closed-minded perception that we have when we, when we think of school shootings, because we don't see it. They only show the kids walking away in a, in a, yeah. in a line. Yeah. Every other thing that you wanted people to you know, feel, there's so much content for you to put yourself in the person's shoes. We haven't been put in the kid's shoes still to this day. Any news report only shows the kids walking away. Mm. And they rarely, rarely ever talk to them about, you know, what their life is like now. And once, and if they do, they're a nuisance to that big lobby arm. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's next level bullying mm. is, is what, I, what I call it. We're not saying that, you know, we want to take the right to bear arms away. Just how about some like protocol and checks? Mm. People that have mental health issues should not have weapons. Just like, if you, if you have too many DUIs, you can't drive a car. Like, and a car is just as dangerous as a, as a gun, but the DMV and department, th that whole department, there's regulations there. If you wanna have a freaking, your own private airplane, if you have a lot of money, you can't go buy a stealth bomber. You know that. But why is it that I could go out right now and buy like military freaking weapons? What the hell am I trying to kill? Mm. Right? We're not saying like we want to take away your rifle to go out and game. We're saying that AK-47 thing? Come on, guys. Yeah. You know that ain't right. Like, America? Mm. I mean, I, I, that sounds like, you know, a, a country that's developed, a war-torn country. Mm. So if we've never had, if we're lucky enough to never, if we're lucky enough to not have many wars on our soil. Yeah. Why do we have war equipment in people's homes? And still, according to the president, we're the best country in the world. Do you agree with him, Naomi? Do, do, does any sane person agree with him on anything? <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to him? Because obviously he's here, he addressed the forum yesterday. What would you like to say to him? So I am the youngest delegate um, at the forum, and I am also the youngest American. 
Um, and you'd think that maybe people had mentioned Trump wanting to meet with me, or because like you know Americans like he's here, but but no, um, I. I know what I would say to him. Um, so his whole campaign slogan from 2015, 2016, make America great again. Yeah. I would like to ask him when America was great. Was it great when we were pushing indigenous people out of their land? Was it great when black people were being raped and slaughtered? Was it great when people had to sit and protest while being beaten just so they could eat lunch at a lunch counter? Was it great? With all of this violence going on right now, I don't understand what he's talking about. America, um, and the woman in the car yesterday might have disagreed with me, but America has own, it is a good place for mm. immigrants, it is. Yes. Um, as an immigrant, I can understand that. But to a certain extent, America's, um, the way America functions only works for people um, in the top 1%. It only works for people with an immense amount of privilege because you you don't get treated equally if you're a person of color, if you're Jewish, if you're Muslim. And so, no, it's it's not an equal place, and it's definitely not the country, um, the best country in the world. And I think what um, speaks uh, volumes about our president is the fact that Australia is burning down right now yeah. and he got up on that stage and he talked about how great America was and Notre Dame so um, also if you look at New Zealand and the mosque attacks there mm -hmm. they then changed the laws afterwards didn't they for assault weapons but to we ban. can't do that yeah so they actually taking taking the lead look I know that a lot of people have questions so please if you could put your hands up and I will start with, I'm just going to start um, with you in the back there. <coughs> yes, you. <laughs> Hi, I'm James from Westport, Connecticut, in the United States. I was just wondering if either of you have any specific gun violence related policy that you would like to see put in place? Background checks, Background start checks. there. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> Background checks. I mean, I mean, it sounds so simple, right? I know. But if you're not American right. and you're like, yeah. wait a second. You guys don't have background checks? That sounds we, insane. Anybody can go in there and purchase a gun, no ID, no. They don't need anything. They just need the money to purchase the gun. Um, and that person walking into that store could be anybody. We yeah. don't know if they're going to be a responsible gun owner. We don't know if they're a danger to themselves or to others. We don't know anything about them, their family situation. Mm. We just know that this person is purchasing a machine gun, mm. which is a red flag in and of itself. But, <laughs> yeah. It's background checks, but what about assault weapons as well? Would you like to see them? Yeah. Let's start with background checks. Yeah. If we could get that passed, then assault weapons, we could get that passed. Yeah. But it, to go straight, because that, that bully lobbying arm is, you know, what it, what it looks like, pretty strong and manipulative. Very strong. That, yes, assault weapons should not be in people's homes, but especially not in crazy people's hands. But to start with background checks, you'd think would be simple. Next question. Yes, in the front here. I think, I think there's a mic coming to you. So my name's Noah, and obviously your activism deals with very heavy topics, whether it be um, gun control or racism and inequality in the US. How do you manage to keep yourself inspired and to actually take action rather than getting depressed and becoming paralyzed? How do you, how do you push yourself? So, so I think a lot of activists um, get really caught up in trying to save the world. They don't focus on trying to save themselves first and trying to focus on themselves and take care of themselves. I feel like activists feel like they have this entire weight on their shoulders and they have to carry the weight of the world with them and they it's their responsibility to do this and I just I've needed to recognize that I I have a lot of anger and I have a lot of pain and sadness but I need to channel that into something more so that I'm not just sitting around throwing a pity party for myself in the state of the country but I'm actually doing something about it which can make anybody feel better in the long run um, for me my unit, I know I'm not alone. Um, and there's other folks that have been through it 
that are fighting for it. And that gives me comfort and this sense of purpose to, you know, either help out by amplifying someone else's um, passions, like uh, Parkland Rising, or um, amplify my own internal fire to spread uh, knowledge of the situation and love. Next question, yes. Hi, I'm Sakshi Talwar from India. My question is, what is the biggest resistance you faced when you were stand, uh, starting your foundation? And, uh, and as far as you're concerned, when you walked out of your school, what was the biggest resistance you had challenge, faced at that point of time? Um, so my biggest resistance was definitely the school and the school board. They when we presented the idea, they told us that, that was that gun violence and advocacy in general was something for middle school and high school students. And us being a bunch of 10 and 11 year olds um, wasn't really what you'd usually sh see. But um, I, there was actually a sign after I gave my speech um, that was put onto the school lawn by someone who lived in the neighborhood um, that said, we stand with you, Naomi. Um, and the school took it down because they just, they weren't very um, supportive and people would send letters um, to the school about what we had all done. And I mean, it's just the school board wasn't a good, and of course um, I moved, but I lived in like the middle of white suburbia in Virginia. So there wasn't really um, a lot of talk about that. Uh, so for me, resistance, at first, you know, whenever there's a natural disaster, they usually call on us musicians or folks that have a megaphone to bring awareness to those issues. Um, and for so long, um, my neighborhood was invisible. I, whether, whenever, whenever there's a tsunami, we show up. But there's a tsunami every day in my neighborhood. Whenever there's an earthquake, we show up, but there's an earthquake every day in my neighborhood. There's some type of you know, urgency, emergency in neighborhoods like mine. Um, so I wanted to you know, take matters in my own hands and not wait for a handout. So once I realized what you can do in your own community, you realize there's no resistance. Um, it's just getting folks to join, the kids to join. Um, and if you do it with with an inspiring heart um, and empathy on what they might be going through, you, you, get, you get the kids to join on. And, and we, we're really successful at I Am Angel. And then there's fundraising. We always panic this time of the year, but we always pull through. <laughs> yeah. I think we've got time for probably one more question. Yes, right at the back, the young lady, yes. Hi, my name is Diana. I'm from the Netherlands, and I was wondering uh, for gun issues specifically, you also, of course, mentioned the US a lot, and it sometimes feels for us from countries where we might not have that issue as strongly, that I'm wondering, do you think there is something that we could do to kind of support, support you in this issue? Because we, of course, don't have influence on the legislature. Uh, so do you think we should do something? And if so, what do you think we can do? That's a really good question. Yeah. That a very controversial answer um, is connected to that question. So whenever there's something happening in like a developing country and there's like a dictator and the citizens are in harm's way, the world gets together and say, we need to help them. They're not solving their problem. Look at these kids, they're dying. Well, guess what? That's happening in our country. And it's taken a long time for the Calvary to come and help these kids out. They're not being educated properly as far as investment, and they're in harm's way. They're dying at school. Not just once or twice. Last year, there were hundreds of school shootings. So, yeah, the world could help us out. Um, but that's controversial. Uh, Americans would be like, what are you talking about? Well, I am the world, we're American. We're the world's police. Well, well then help out these kids in school then, is what I say. Yeah. Because kids should not have to be fearful 
for their lives to go to school and learn about life. So I don't know, I don't know the answer. I don't know how, I don't know what it is, but I know we need a megaphone. We need support so these kids could have a, a safe passage. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to draw this discussion to a close. But I just want to ask both of you, one year from today, what is the change that you would most like to see? And as Will, you were saying so eloquently, to really make schools a safe place where kids can go and learn and not be shot. I'd like to see a spike in voter registration. Um, I think that a lot of young people think that they have no power, 18 and up obviously in the US, but think that they have no power and they can't control what's going on in politics or in the White House. But in actuality, we, we do have power. And when I'm 18, 16 maybe, um, I'll be able to vote and my vote will count just like everybody else's vote will count. And so we can choose who we want to elect and we can choose who we want to put in office and we can be the ones running for office. Um, we can be the ones who are in charge. And um, I just think I want to see more action and less talking because I think a lot of times at these kind of events, people come and they talk about what they want to see happen and they talk about the issues, but then when they leave, they don't do anything and they go back to their house, to their comfortable lives and forget all about it. Just yeah. like what happens with most school shootings. There's two or three months where everybody's all freaked out and everybody's like sending their thoughts and prayers. Yes. And then maybe like a year later, everybody forgets. And I'm so glad to see that's not happening with Marjorie Stem and Douglas, and so I just like to see more of that. And Will? A year from now? Five years from now, because I don't want to say something a year from now, and then nothing happens, and I'm pissed, and then I like, give up, because nothing <laughs> happened in a year. Because a year goes by fast, especially when you have pop-up distractions. Um, but five years from now, if five years from now, no warlike weapons in people's in civilian hands, like AK-47s and machine guns like that, um, no more school shootings, keeping kids safe background checks so that wackos don't have, you know, weapons that could massacre everybody in this room. Um, and uh, that's something to accomplish five years from now. We'll be, it'll be 2025. We'll be mid-century. Sorry? We'll be mid-decade, um, 2025. And this, this, this decade's really important. Other things will be in, in culture in 2025, things that we can't even imagine. Think about how you think it, there's tension now. When autonomous vehicles are all over the road, that means there's not that many Uber drivers and truck drivers. When supermarkets have AI um, cash registers that you don't need cash registers, so many people are going to lose jobs at sales. POS jobs are in, in fit, brick and mortar. There's going to be so many jobs that are, that are uh, taken away from us. And because we're not educating folks, there's not going to be you know, folks that are rapidly creating new jobs. There's going to be so much tension in the states. And, we, and we're not talking about those things um, in the media, about what's coming around the corner. We talk about it here every year at, at Davos. And we know it's coming. And the things that we're, that we're hooping and hollering about are things that we should have solved a long time ago. But that's a dangerous mix. Crazy military weapons in the hands of unchecked citizens that don't have jobs because machines took them away from them. And you didn't prepare them and reskill them. That's scary. So we need to, we need to, we need to fix fast. And so five years, yes. 
That, that's planned for five years because a year from now we're, we're going to be in a place where we're going to feel paralyzed because nothing happened. Mm. But if we put five years and we have like, you know, transparency and earmarks on what we've accomplished along the way, um, because we know, we, we know these, these, these devices are being deployed. That new Tesla truck is awesome. That's the best truck, best looking truck I've ever seen in my life. And it's going to be freaking great. My Tesla drives itself. Can't turn corners yet, but that's what we're testing it for. Yeah. <laughs> we're out there teaching it. And everybody that has a Tesla is training it right now. Mm. And Mercedes electric is coming too. All these electric cars are coming. Mm. Autonomous vehicles are coming. And you know what they're going to do. And you know how pissed off people are going to be. If coal miners are tripping right now, whoa. So we, we, there's a lot of like waking up we need to do in America. And I'm a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> and a very good one. <laughs> so, I'm just saying, it's like, wow, it's like, damn. But it's cool, I'm more than a rapper. Let's wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about wrapping, wrapping it up, well, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking my incredible guests here this evening, the extraordinary, the inspiring Naomi Wadler, and of course, the wonderful Will I Am. Can I say, can I say one more thing yes. to Naomi? Yes, yes, absolutely, go ahead. I have. I have nieces and nephews, little black nieces, and they're like 11, 12, 13, 14. And hearing you talk, it's watching you, how strong you are, how clear you are. I would love my nieces and nephews to like grow up, not even grow up, they're like a year younger than you. <laughs> but I can't wait to go home and tell them about you because, you know, you're going to be a special adult. You're going to be one of those people that you look, you look at and be like, I wonder what they were like when they were younger. We're, we're seeing that now. Like Nelson Mandela, I wonder what he was like when he was 14. We never got to see that. I never, we never got to see Martin Luther King when he was 14. We never got to see these leaders. So watching you, I'm like, wow, I'm watching you at this age, and knowing what my imagination and what, where your heart's leading you and your mind is leading you, what you're gonna be like at my age. You're gonna be awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you so much. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Will.